Minerals, energy and agriculture. Now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities. Supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Good afternoon and good morning to all of you. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the second session of the day three, Exploring for the Future program, showcase event. I'm sure all of you enjoying the great science presentations from Geoscience Australia staff in the last couple of days. And we have got one more today, one more day to go to cover all the wonderful science what we have done as part of the Exploring for the Future program. My name is Baskaran Sandaram. I'm the Director of uh, Groundwater Geoscience within the Basin Systems Branch at uh, Geoscience Australia. I'll be chairing this session. And this session will focus on sedimentary basin resource potential, covering source rocks, carbon capture and storage, and groundwater. Before we kickstart all the presentations, I would like to acknowledge the Nanawal and Nambri people who have lived and shared the culture to all of us in this region for many thousands of years. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I would like to thank all the First Nations people who provided their support by allowing us in their lands to collect all the data in the last eight years. Thank you very much, guys. Not only that, finally, I would like to a warm welcome to all the First Nations people. I'm sure yesterday we heard about mapping the physical, chemical, and geological properties of Australian tectonic plate. Today, we'll be focusing on specific commodities. And we started with hydrogen this morning. If you missed any session, I would like to access outputs. We are releasing their links on the showcase webpage. And we have done this work with extensive collaboration from a range of stakeholders across the continent. We would like to take this opportunity to thank all the collaborators for the time and their input to this EFTF program. And this session is focused on resources contained in sedimentary basins. 
In particular, it has a focus on advancements in the provision of organic geochemistry data, a synthesis of carbon dioxide storage opportunities, and establishing a national groundwater cover framework. And there will be a question and session, answer session at the end of all the presentations. But however, I will encourage everyone, put your questions in the Q&A stream at the top of your screen, which you will see that. Don't wait until the last minute. The speakers are presenting their science work on behalf of the, the whole team, which involved many scientists, administrators, and other professionals who have supported this. If they cannot answer your questions, but they will be happy to take on notice and come back to you via email at eftf at ga.gov.au. Don't forget the website. Our first speaker in this session is um, Dr. Diane Edwards, who will talk about the Australian source rock and fluid atlas. Accessible visions built on historical data archives. It will be a wonderful presentation. You won't be disappointed. Diane will be a, he is a senior petroleum geochemist and her focus is on assessing conventional and unconventional petroleum systems, including the distribution of hydrogen and helium. Diane is a custodian of organic geochemistry database in Geosense Australia, which is called the OCHEM. She holds a Master of Science from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, UK, and she has got a doctorate degree from the University of Adelaide. It is my time to hand over to Diane for her wonderful presentation. Thank you, Diane. Today, I will be talking to you about the Australian Source Rock and Fluid Atlas, built on historical data archives held in the Orchem database and delivered through Geoscience Australia's Data Discovery Portal. This presentation is going to take you on a geoenergy data journey from the drilling of the first wells in Australia to the vast data sets collected in the Exploring for the Future program. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors who helped populate and build the database and deliver the database in the Atlas. I would also like to extend my thanks to other team members, starting with the repository where the rocks and national oil and gas collection are stored, to our laboratory technicians who analyse the samples, and the MEG Information Services and Geological Indexing for providing digital pathways for getting our science to users, as presented by Mark Webster. And finally, the data and data digital services team who maintain and build the portal. The energy section is delivering data of enduring value to the nation in support of the government's energy transition to net zero. Today I'm going to be talking about the laboratory analysis and data delivery of sample-based data from the Orchem database, with a focus on source rocks and their generated fluids collected from sedimentary basins. These samples originate from petroleum stratigraphic wells drilled across the Australian continent that have organic geochemistry, petrology and stable isotope data. Importantly, I will demonstrate how pre-competitive data acquired through the Exploring for the Future program and legacy data sets can be repurposed to help solve today's challenges. The Geoscience Australia Data Discovery Portal is key for discovery and accessibility of spatially located data that can be downloaded as maps and digital data files in the Source Rock and Fluid Atlas persona. The portal is used widely by the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division to deliver data. My talk starts with an introduction to what is the Source Rock and Fluid Atlas and how it is accessed. I will show you where the data comes from, why we collect it and who benefits. And then I will have a description of the Orchem data tables and end with the conclusions. The Source Rock and Fluid Atlas is an online digital atlas of organic geochemistry, organic petrology and stabilised tope data for samples. From sedimentary basins with a focus on fine grained sedimentary rocks, including mudstones, and carbonates. Organic rich rocks which have the potential to generate hydrocarbons are called source rocks. If there are no source rocks within a basin, then there is no oil or wet gas. 
The pores in these rocks contain fluids, either natural gas, crude oil, or water. While most wells do not encounter oil and gas, every well recovers rocks and can be analysed in future studies. The Orchem Geochemical Database contains the physical and chemical properties of earth materials, molecular composition of organic compounds and the stable isotopes and elements of inorganic and organic compounds. The Orchem Database contains elements, compounds and isotopes of five non-metal elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and sulphur as well as the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. The chemistry of these elements gets complicated very quickly because they can form many compounds, including hundreds of different hydrocarbons, all with isomers, and they all have several stable carbon isotopes. Stable isotopes of carbon and oxygen are also captured for carbonates as well as organic matter. So how do you access the portal in the atlas? From the portal address shown here, go to the left-hand side of the menu and click Layers icon. When you click on this layer group, over 60 layers of many subjects appear in alphabetical order. Hence the geochemistry and the organic geochemistry layers are some way down. So alternatively, there is a quicker way, and that is to use a source rock and atlas persona, which can be found on the right-hand side of the top menu by clicking on the Persona icon. Scroll down and select the Source Rock and Fluids Atlas tab, or use the web link as shown here. The map now changes, and when you click on the About icon, you get information about the atlas. And when you click on the Layers icon, you now get a limited number of layers, including boreholes, geochemistry, geology, infrastructure, and tenements. There's also another layer called the geological storage of carbon dioxide, which is related. When you click on the geochemistry layer, you can see all of the different web services for organic geochemistry. If you go down and select the natural gas composition layer and choose add to map for the hydrogen layer, you can now see the location of the gas samples with the hydrogen data. You can change the legend by clicking on the legend and the style will then show you the concentration of the hydrogen in mole percent. Now you can click on information, which gives you more information about that layer. To download the natural hydrogen gas data, click on the download icon. Select the CSV file, and this data set will now be saved as tabular format. There is also the option to save data in JSON format to read from a web application. Alternatively, you can also save the data in KML or shapefile formats used to display geographic features. The great achievement of the portal is that once you know how to access one layer and download the data, this process is the same for all other data layers. The Hydrogen CSV file is downloaded onto your downloads folder and can be opened up in Excel. I suggest that you sort the columns by geological province, borehole name and sample top depth. All of the data in the tables is displayed in the same order starting with the borehole information. This is then followed by the sample number, sample depth, top depth, base depth. And then we move on and you get information on the geological province and the stratigraphic unit information. Then you scroll over further on your Excel spreadsheet. And in this case, the geochemistry data is shown here with the emphasis being on the hydrogen molecular data shown in the map. This data in Excel has been filtered, but you can also do that in the portal. The molecular data you see in the spreadsheet was obtained using a gas chromatograph, which separates the individual compounds of natural gases. In the bottom trace, you can see where helium and hydrogen is separated. Now I would like to explain where the data comes from and why and who needs it, which is steeped in the history of exploration and legislation and the evolution of laboratory analysis and data discovery technology. There is legislation that must be followed for the drilling of wells on the Australian continent, and there are governance and data discovery guidelines concerning all derived information. There are efficiency gains from entering and quality controlling the data once into an expertly managed database, i.e. have a single point of truth. The data can be used an infinite number of times by many stakeholders for many different reasons. We need large data sets for integration and multi-purpose use, particularly for advanced analytics, machine learning, and for artificial intelligence training datasets. 
These technologies help to develop predictive capabilities and de-risk the discovery of new resources. And finally, we have a laboratory at Geoscience Australia for 56 years, providing pre-competitive data since the BMR to AXO and now to the new Geoscience Australia Laboratory. Over 15,000 petroleum wells and 8,900 stratigraphic wells have been drilled in the Australian continent, as visualised by this clip showing the location of wells drilled each decade, starting before 1910 and continuing to the present day. The most recent drills include the Exploring for the Future, Barnicandi 1 well drilled in the Canning Basin, and the NDI Carrara 1 well drilled in the Carrara Basin. We have loaded geochemistry data from over 6,500 wells, which comprises some 138,000 samples and over a million rows of data. Not all wells have sample data, but there are still a lot of data to be captured. Hence, our data tables are not yet complete, but they are live, data is being added, and the web services update overnight. The Oracle and Pyrolysis and Gas data tables have been running since 1998, with the earliest total organic carbon values being recorded in Majura 1 in 1902. And the earliest gas composition is from Robe 1, drilled in 1915. Interestingly, some of these early wells record high hydrogen values, as explored in Chris Boren's Natural Hydrogen talk. Geoscience Australia's Strategy 2028 states that the ge geoscientific data and physical collections have enduring value. Our Data and Digital Strategy 2028 goes on to say, the government, industry and community expect Geoscience Australia's data and products to be easy to find, access and consume. And I stress the word consume. We have a product catalogue, eCAT, which provides our records and data releases. The output for these are in Word, PDF, Excel or PowerPoint documents. They're easily read by humans, but not by machines. As Mark Webster went on to explain, the data delivery portal provides the technology to consume data. Downloaded tabulated data and spatially located geographic data files. So who benefits? Geoscience is for all Australians. Although the Source Rock and Fluid Atlas contains highly technical data and is primarily used by geoscientists in research organisations, government and companies, everyone should be able to find out where Australia's resources are located and what information available for a borehole drilled anywhere on country. So the last section of my talk lists the data tables available in the Atlas and gives some examples of how we are using the data. The Exploring for the Future project has enabled the existing data tables to be extended to build new ones. We now have web services covering the physical and chemical compositions of sedimentary rocks, crude oils and natural gas. We have three gas data tables that contain molecular and carbon and hydrogen isotopic composition, as well as the stable isotopes of the noble gases. A new web service contains the molecular and isotopic compositions of soil gas, where baseline studies are being conducted in regional New South Wales near Tumut, looking at the distribution of naturally occurring hydrogen helium. The results from this study are presented in Chris Boram's Natural Hydrogen talk, and the data released in this new report will be uploaded into the database. We have eight tables that contain screening data for rocks, including pyrolysis, pyrolysis gas chromatography, and transmitted and reflected light microscopy to look at the organic matter in the rocks. The combined pyrolysis and vitronite reflectance measurements have been combined into a new table, where these two types of analyses are used to screen source rocks for their organic matter content and level of thermal maturity. These data have been collected for over 30 years and we now have over 25,000 records entered. These data are used for import into basin models such as that used in the Adavale Basin in the Exploring for the Future project. In the central part of the basin is the Gilmore Gas Well, where the pyrolysis parameters, total organic carbon, S1, S2, hydrogen index, and vitronite reflectance are plotted down with depth. These parameters are used to constrain the organic richness and thermal maturity used in the models shown here. We have five tables that contain bulk, molecular, and isotopic data for oils, source rocks and fluid inclusions. There is a separate table with the carbon and oxygen isotopes for carbonates. And we have a table where organic and inorganic geochemistry have been combined. So for my last two case studies, 
I'm going to show you the API gravity property from the oil and rock table, followed by an example using the combined organic and inorganic geochemistry. As explained by Claire Patterson's talk, enhanced oil recovery projects inject carbon dioxide into depleted reservoirs to recover the last of the oil resource and information used in these projects are stored in Orchem. Firstly, the natural gas composition table holds the concentration of carbon dioxide in petroleum wells that can be overlaid on basins that may have the potential for enhanced oil recovery projects. Secondly, the density of the API gravity of the oil that is to be recovered typically needs to be greater than 27 degrees. The colours on the legend attempt to match the colours of the oil. The collection of oil from Northern Australia is ordered by the API gravity, which is higher on the left and lower to the right. These are condensates and light crude oils from fields that may be suitable for enhanced oil recovery projects. Another new web service combines the organic and inorganic databases together, which is particularly useful in investigating the redox conditions required for the precipitation of minerals. This is an example from the Tulabuk Formation in Queensland, where you can see that the concentration of uranium increases with the total organic carbon content of the rock. So in conclusion, this is only the beginning. The Exploring for the Future program has enabled the addition of data tables to hold most organic geochemical data sets and develop the Source Rock Fluid Atlas persona for data release in the Data Discovery Portal. Importantly, I have demonstrated how these new Exploring for the Future and legacy data sets can be repurposed to help solve today's challenges particularly in the discovery of natural hydrogen resources, the sequestration and utilisation of carbon dioxide, and the mineral resources coupled with the organic matter in source rocks. The task now is to enter more data, integrate these into regional mapping projects, and give more talks about how to use these data sets. Thank you. What a great and methodical presentation by Diane. Thank you, Diane. The accessibility of this organic chemistry data is a benchmark in this field. And as a result, I'm sure we will see growing applications. Now, our second speaker, Claire Patterson, will present on carbon dioxide, where we can put it and how much it costs. Over to you, Claire. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you for the opportunity to share the findings of our work on carbon capture and storage under the Exploring for the Future program. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my many co-authors and collaborators from Geoscience Australia, CSIRO, Monash University, and our technical consultants who carried out much of the work that I'll be presenting on on behalf of the teams today. The title of this talk is a question that we've been working on for decades at Geoscience Australia, where our first national CO2 storage assessment project began in 1999. Since then, Geoscience Australia has narrowed down some of the most prospective locations for geologic storage of CO2 with national, regional and basin scale studies. We've also done a variety of work on monitoring and de-risking storage, such as looking at the effect of faults on containment. So why have we done so much work in this area? If the world is going to reach net zero emissions, no single technology is going to get us there. The solution to elevated emissions is multifaceted and will involve many different energy solutions targeted to different industries and scenarios. You can see a number of these technologies on this graphic. On the right, you have various renewable technologies such as solar, wind and hydro that can help us move away from fossil fuels and also help power the hydrogen industry. Then there's geothermal energy, which has great potential for heating applications and possibly power generation. But unfortunately, not all emissions can be avoided, at least in the short term. Hydrocarbons are still going to be part of the energy mix for the upcoming decades. And some industries such as cement production can't avoid CO2 emissions as they are produced during chemical processes. These industries will require carbon storage to proceed in a sustainable way. With the integration of direct air capture technologies and bioenergy plants in the future, CCS will be able to remove and permanently store atmospheric CO2, making it a negative emissions technology. And that means it will play an important role in balancing our future carbon budget by locking away CO2 that we've already emitted and that will continue to be emitted from dispersed sources like farming, deforestation and other land use changes. It is for these reasons that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has stated that the world won't achieve net zero without a significant scale up of CCS. 
For anyone less familiar with the technology, here is a refresher. Carbon capture and storage refers to capturing CO2 from high emission sources, such as power stations or industrial plants, and transporting them to a suitable site where, where it's injected for deep, permanent storage in geological formations. There are two main types of geological formations suitable for carbon storage, which are depleted oil and gas fields and saline aquifers, as depicted in this image. Depleted field storage usually relies on a structural trap, like a dome structure covered by impermeable rock, which prevents migration of CO2. Whereas saline aquifers generally have thicker reservoirs and storage containment, which relies on slow CO2 migration and dissolution of CO2 into the formation water. But I should emphasize that these aquifers are very deep and not suitable for human use. There are a growing number of CCS projects in development in Australia, targeting storage in both depleted fields and saline aquifers. Australia has 403 million tonnes of demonstrated CO2 storage resources, with more than 9 million tonnes of CO2 having already been permanently stored. The coloured circles on this map show the locations and development status of 16 Australian commercial CCS projects that have dedicated storage components, as well as the cross-border Bayou Undan CCS project located offshore in Timor-Leste. We have also included a pilot scale project being the Otway International Test Centre. Of the 16 commercial scale projects, one is um, operational and that is the Gorgon CCS, which has stored almost 10 million tonnes of CO2 since 2019. The project under construction is Moomba CCS, which is expected to come online in a couple of months. And there are 14 other projects across the country, ranging from advanced development through to feasibility stage. We're expecting more projects to be announced offshore due to the 10 greenhouse gas storage acreage release areas that were made available for bidding in 2023, with those donated, denoted by yellow polygons in this map. There are further storage opportunities to be identified as more storage is required to realise our significant carbon storage potential and to help Australia and our region decarbonise. This is highlighted by the Australian Government's Future Gas Strategy, which aims to promote geological storage of CO2 and support our region's transition to net zero by releasing acreage for offshore CCS and establish a new initiative on regional cooperation on transboundary carbon capture and storage, which will provide options for energy security and carbon management solutions for our regional partners. Today, I'll be focusing on four core outputs from our CCS work that aim to answer our burning question. Where can we put CO2 and how much will it cost? Part one will comprise our CO2 storage assessments using a play-based approach. Part two is on investigating the CO2 storage potential in residual oil zones. In part three, I'll summarise our findings from our review into the management of brine extracted from CO2 storage reservoirs. In part four, I'll let you know about our work on our CO2 storage economic fairways tool and CCS spatial data portal. So let's delve into part one. My colleagues have been using a play-based approach to resource assessments with the aim of identifying energy super basins that will enable net zero emissions by 2050. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, a play consists of a defined geologic interval that, geological interval that has a reservoir seal pair. And an energy super basin is a basin with favourable alignment of gas, CCS and renewable hydrogen resources. To undertake play-based resource assessments, a workflow was developed beginning with a gap analysis, followed by post-drill analysis, seismic reprocessing and interpretation. Then we have play definition and stratigraphic correlation. You'll be hearing more about stratigraphic correlation from our next presenter, Dr. Nadej Rolay. And the next steps in the workflow are qualitative and then quantitative resource assessments. My colleague, Dr. Tom Bernick, would be very disappointed with me if I failed to mention the most important thing about this workflow. So I'd like to emphasize that this methodology has been developed based on an industry standard approach. It can therefore be easily applied by industry stakeholders with their existing data and skills to regions of their interest for streamlined assessments of energy and water resources, particularly in data poor regions like saline aquifers. On the left of my slide is a schematic diagram which shows how these two CO2 storage prospectivity maps were generated by stacking a series of risk element layers for a given play. The stacked layers include injectivity, storage efficiency, containment and structural complexity, with areas of high prospectivity or suitability in green and low prospectivity in orange. This systematic approach helps us understand geological controls on prospectivity, allowing us to determine the relative prospectivity of each play and identify sweet spots for potential future resource developments. 
It's a more practical approach compared to traditional CO2 storage studies, which don't always consider constraints like reservoir injectivity, which can lead to large and unrealistic storage capacity estimates. Here I've shown a couple of recent examples of play-based CO2 storage resource assessments. On the left is the CO2 storage prospectivity map for the Paterka Western Aramanga region, and on the right is the prospectivity map for the Tulachi play interval in the Cooper Basin, which was undertaken as part of the Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program. Please see the references below for further information and to access the datasets used in these studies. I also highly recommend that you head to Geoscience Australia's YouTube page and check out Dr Barry Bradshaw's seminar here. The stacked layers used in prospectivity maps are derived from post-drill analysis. Post-drill analysis is usually used by industry for hydrocarbon exploration, where each well is assessed for the presence or absence of a reservoir seal trap and charge. But what our team has done is built on this method and tailored it for CCS to instead assess containment, storage capacity and injectivity using these six parameters shown in the triangles. On the left of the slide is an example from the post-drill analysis from the Namur Murta play in the Paderka Basin. The analysis included 41 oil and gas exploration wells. And if you look at the multivariate symbols, you can see the areas where they are mostly green and these are those that are more prospective for CO2 storage. However, there are some areas that have red in the left two triangles demonstrating of structural complexity and top seals. This method was repeated for 11 play intervals and also for conventional and unconventional hydrocarbons. This workflow is really useful as a first pass assessment when trying to target potential CO2 storage sites, particularly in data poor regions like saline aquifers. And you might be wondering, what about storage in depleted fields? What's Geoscience Australia doing about that? This brings me to part two, our work on CO2 storage potential in residual oil zones. So what is a residual oil zone? Geologic residual oil zones, or ROSs, are naturally water flooded reservoirs below the oil water contact or without a main pay zone that contain immobile oil of appreciable continuity and extent that's left behind after the mobile portion of oil is displaced by formation water. Residual oil zones have significant potential for CO2 storage because they have large volumes, like saline aquifers, and they can add to depleted field storage. They may also benefit from existing infrastructure, experience and knowledge. To investigate the possibility of CO2 storage in residual oil zones, we had two main questions to address. Firstly, can we identify them in Australian basins? To answer this, we undertook a petrophysical appraisal of fields in selected basins to identify, qualify and characterise residual oil zones. And secondly, we wanted to find out exactly how much CO2 could be stored and how much oil would be produced. For this, we built a conceptual reservoir model of an Australian type residual oil zone and ran some scenarios to look at CO2 storage efficiency and behaviour of the phases. I don't have time to go through it in detail, but in brief, we developed a workflow to find residual oil zones. And it began with preliminary and geological screening of over 350 wells and fields, followed by petrophysical analysis and then we verified our results using direct evidence from drilling. Here's an example showing the petrophysical appraisal of Dullingari 29, a well in the Aramanga Basin. The main petrophysical parameter to identify residual oil zones is resistivity, because higher resistivity is correlated with more oil. And therefore, resistivity can be used to calculate hydrocarbon saturation as plotted here on the right, where the green zones correspond to depths with more oil. We also checked for evidence of oil in core material known as shows and formation tests to support our petrophysical analysis. So in this well, we have oil production in the Namur and McKinley formations where you can see the high oil saturations and corresponding strong oil shows. The oil saturation reduces and shows become weaker in the transition zone. But what we're really interested in is the large confirmed residual oil zone below, which can be seen in multiple wells across the field with a calculated oil saturation between 15 and 30% and supporting evidence in shows and formation tests. This is a novel approach to residual oil zone identification and the workflow that we developed can be readily applied in other areas across the country. For the modelling part of this project, we set up a 3D model, which was populated to reflect Australian geological reservoir permeability distribution. To model storage in a residual oil zone, our colleagues at CSIRO had to first create a residual oil zone in the model by allowing oil to leak out the top of the reservoir. Today, I'll be showing you the results from one of our injection scenarios that models 20 years of CO2 injection at a rate of 1 million tonnes per annum. 
This scenario was designed to maximise CO2 storage and involved CO2 injection from five wells into the top of the reservoir and oil production from one well at the bottom of the reservoir. In this model, the blue represents water and the colours increasing in gradient towards red represent oil in the left diagram and CO2 in the right diagram. You'll be able to see the residual oil zone getting pushed down in the left of the diagram, while CO2 accumulates in the top of the reservoir on the right diagram. The results from this scenario demonstrate significant storage potential in residual oil zones. With over 13 million tonnes of CO2 stored over 20 years and a storage efficiency of 18.46%. For more information on our petrophysical appraisal or modelling of CO2 storage in residual oil zones, please see our reports, which will be published in the coming months. Our modelling got us thinking about the management of byproduct brine that is sometimes extracted from storage sites, and that's what I'll be covering now in part three. Brine extraction can be required for pressure management and or optimization of CO2 storage. Extracted brine will need to be managed and early consideration is important because it can have implications for project design and cost. Brine management is site specific depending on factors like quality and volume of brine, regulations, environmental constraints, social acceptance and proximity to other industries. Some key disposal options for extracted brine include evaporation, crystallisation and encapsulation, deep well disposal and marine outfall. But in some cases, extracted brine has potential to be beneficially used and that's what we were most interested in. We reviewed many brine use options in our study, far too many to go into now. These options listed on the slide can be broadly divided based on their key outputs being low carbon energy, minerals or water. Geothermal energy, for example, could potentially be harvested from brine uh, from storage reservoirs that are in hot sedimentary aquifers. For more information on this study, please see our publication which will be released soon. Many of you would have heard about Geoscience Australia's Economic Fairways Mapper, as it's been used to map the potential for critical minerals and hydrogen production across Australia. And in session one this morning, my colleague Marcus Haynes spoke about the development of the much anticipated green steel Economic Fairways Mapper. And now it's time for me to let you know about our CCS Economic Fairways tool, which is the final part of my talk. So this tool is in development, but here's an early output showing the results from running it with five storage sites and an injection rate of 5 million tonnes of CO2 per annum. The lighter areas in the map correspond to areas where storage and transport costs are predicted to be less expensive based on distance to storage sites, the geological conditions of each site, and proximity to infrastructure and other factors. This is a multi-criteria decision support tool to assist industry, investors, policy and decision makers in planning CO2 storage projects, hubs and infrastructure in Australia. Our initial testing shown here generated unrealistically low storage costs and we're attempting to update the underlying cost models with more realistic values. To make this tool as useful and realistic as possible, we'd like to consult with industry stakeholders, so please reach out to us if you're interested in this. When the tool is ready, it'll be published in a new portal persona called OzCCUS. This will be a single access point for the tool and spatial CCS data, which can be visualised, inspected and downloaded from the site. Users will be able to access our recent work, such as play-based CO2 storage resource assessments, the EOR potential of basins, which you can see here, um, the traffic light colouring on the map, and the concentration of CO2 in natural gas samples, which are the light blue black dots in this map. This CO2 concentration data was compiled by Dr. Diane Edwards, who presented it in her previous talk. And the persona will also include supporting data sets, including current CCS projects and spatial data from past CCS studies, going all the way back to our first national study in 1999. In wrapping up, I'd like to leave you with three key messages. Firstly, there are more storage opportunities available in Australia in remote ba basins and residual oil zones, and there's a need to re-evaluate Australia's total CO2 storage potential numbers. And secondly, brine management will be required for many CCS projects and re represents an opportunity with possibilities like geothermal energy generation. Finally, uh, please keep an eye out for the release of our Australian CCS data portal and integrated economic fairways tool. I hope we've helped answer some of your questions about CO2 storage locations and associated costs in Australia. If you'd like to know more about our work on CCS, please see the web pages listed here or reach out to us. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Claire, for delivering such a wonderful presentation. Those of you who don't know Claire, 
She's a geoscientist in the Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice Team at Geoscience Australia. And she's working across CCS, Low Carbon Emission Technology, and she holds a Bachelor of Advanced Science from the ANU. Next, we will hear from Dr. Nadez Rowlett on the National Aquifer Framework, putting the geology into hydrogeology. Nadez has been a senior scientist at Geosense Australia for over 20 years. She worked across a number of areas. Her interest is in integrating workflows and technologies to enhance groundwater science. Although she worked across a number of areas, recently she has been working in groundwater geoscience team and she is developing a 3D national hydrogeological framework for Australia. That's amazing to see that Geoscience Australia is developing a 3D national hydrogeological framework for Australia. This is the first thing I could say that that will be very useful for most of the stakeholders. Nadez, she is holds a MSc and Doctor of Science from the University of Paris. And she will be telling us some of the good things what she has been doing as part of the developing this 3D hydrogeological framework. Over to you, Nadez. For the past two years, Geoscience Australia worked together with the Bureau of Meteorology and States and Territory to update the National Aquifer Framework to help improve decision-making across government, industry, and communities. We also worked across groundwater, mineral, and energy teams to develop a common 3D continental framework to improve our understanding of the, of the subsurface geology and its influence on groundwater, mineral, and energy systems. So such common framework helps to better integrate approaches and solutions for multiple outcomes. But first, I would like to thank all my colleagues listed here for their team efforts, as they all worked in different parts of the workflow. So why is it important? Why do we need a common framework? As you all know, in Australia, we live in one of the driest continents that relies heavily on groundwater. Groundwater is the main source of water across 60% of the continent, and it represents more than 30% of our total water consumption. It is crucial for our ecosystems, economy, and water security. Water connects all of us, all life, through the land, the seas, and waterways, and it gives us a sense of belonging. So we need to take care of it, but first, we need to understand what a groundwater system is. So this includes understanding the groundwater flow pathways in a 3D network of underground aquifers from the surface water down to unconfined and fractured aquifers through and down to the deeper confined aquifers. So these water pathways will depend on the 3D geometry of these aquifers and aquitard, but also it will depend on their internal structural and lithological variability and their rock properties that control their capacity for the water to flow, either through a connected or a compartmentalized system. So to map groundwater systems at a continental scale, we need to understand the spatial distribution of these aquifers and aquitard across multiple jurisdictions. And as you can see in Australia, on the map on the right-hand side, we have large groundwater systems, such as the Great Artesian Basin, which is the largest groundwater systems in all the world. It covers a fifth of the continent and spans across four different jurisdictions. It supports different uh, sectors, and it represents more than $12.8 billion in economic activity annually. So managing such resource requires having a common understanding of the system and its connectivity with the overlying shallower systems such as the Lacquer Basin and the underlying basins that are the focus for energy and minerals interest. 
So we need to integrate different data sets from multiple agencies to reach this common understanding of the stacked groundwater systems and their potential connectivity. So to achieve this, we developed an approach in the Great Artesian Basin first, and then we extended it to the whole continent. So to integrate different data to generate 3D models of sedimentary systems that influence where the water will flow underground, we can use different methodology, and the difference in methodology will have significant uh, results as shown on those two bottom images. On the left, using a lithostratigraphic approach, you match bore log patterns to correlate geological units laterally, and these results in interpreting multi-layered aquifers that are connected horizontally between well one and well two. Whereas on the right-hand side, using a chronostratigraphic approach, you also correlate the lithology, but through time. So we add an edge constraint to date the edge of the sedimentary layers deposited through time. And we use uh, to do this either biostratigraphic data or zircon edge dating or chemostratigraphy or other techniques. So this helps to map the order of deposition of this material that change laterally. So with these techniques, this results in interpreting one aquifer due to the, deep, the interpreted dipping layers, and groundwater is, the connectivity in groundwater is reduced, mostly uh, connected at the top of this aquifer. So this will have implication when interpreting groundwater connectivity in large systems and how we manage groundwater at the whole of basin scale. This chronostratigraphic approach was developed and used for the past 30 years by the petroleum industry to help improve their understanding of petroleum systems. This approach helped to map paleogeographic distribution of different materials deposited through time and in different environments. And we use this approach to improve our understanding of groundwater systems. So as you can see on these images, the orange and brown colors represent the distribution of fluvial detaic systems that were deposited during the Jurassic and Cretaceous. And these systems correlate with some important aquifers, such as the Hutton Aquifer and the Kanahui Ore Aquifers, that hold important groundwater resources within the Great Artesian Basin. So we can use these maps to refine our understanding of the distribution of aquifers and aquitard through time. But then, uh, we want to add the third dimension to these maps with depths by integrating with borehole stratigraphy. So this helps us to correlate time equivalent geological units with depths, and this helps to reconcile different lithologies in space, but it also helps reconcile diverse historic nomenclature across multiple jurisdictions. So with this standardized terminology, we can then integrate more systematically different data sets across multiple jurisdictions. This helps us to better understand how each unit can extend across the whole basin, such as the Hutton Aquifer highlighted in red here. And it can also help delineate some aquifers that are made of multiple named subdivisions, such as the Kanawi Ure Aquifers, that also extend across multiple jurisdictions. So to do this, we use an integrated chronostratigraphic workflow. And in addition to the borehole stratigraphy, we also integrate other geoscientific data at various scales from legacy to newly acquired data, such as airborne electromagnetic data, seismic, gravity, and magnetic data, and the solid geology. We bring all this information in a common platform in a 3D space. And we correlate the interpretation using a chronostratigraphic framework. And we also link all the geological units to the Australian Stratigraphic Unit Database. So this helps us to update and align the information to the current geological understanding and help update the information more efficiently. So using this workflow, we can then interpret consistently geological surfaces that correlate with aquifers and aquitard boundaries. 
we can also map major structures and the lateral variability of facies within those units, which influence where the water will flow through the system. So using all this information, we then create 3D models to help improve our understanding of the hydrogeology. So since the completion of the Great Artesian Basin project in 2022, we continued compiling and integrating additional data sets within the Great Artesian Basin and also in the overlying Lacquer Basin, so we could reach this common understanding. We continued interpreting the stratigraphy and revising the stratigraphy in some thousands of boreholes that hold palynology and zircon edge dating constraints. And we did this along key regional transects to have this consistent interpretation across the whole basin. We also integrated with publicly accessible seismic data and recently acquired airborne electromagnetic data to help refine the 3D geometry of the recharge bed and how they connect with the shallow and the deeper aquifers. A large part of this work uh, consists of integrating and QCing all the data from various jurisdictions and to update our national databases at Geoscience Australia. So using all this information, we correlated the geological units against the geological time scale and with depths. So we were able to revise the whole of GAP stratigraphy that is now consistent across the whole basin. This helped us to refine the extent and thicknesses of aquifers and aquitard consistently across multiple jurisdictions. We then map the internal lithological variability within each unit using Sanchez ratios calculation on key wells across the basin. And this helped us to better classify the aquifers and aquitard and potentially uh, map their connectivity laterally and vertically through the system. For example, within the Kanahui array, we can see now that it's not an aquifer everywhere Groundwater may be compartmentalized in multiple aquifers, such as in the Eramanga Basin, compared to groundwater being more connected in the Surat Basin. So using this common framework and integrating regional and local scale data, we refine the 3D geological model that includes 18 layers from the basement and up to the ground surface. And through this animation, you can see each layer uh, showing the different subdivision within the Great Artesian Basin units and the overlying Lacquer Basin. This 3D geological model helped to visualize the 3D geometry of the aquifers and aquitard, and it also uh, can be used as a tool for different purposes, such as calculate approximate volume of aquifers and also uh, support water balance estimates. Uh, it's also a fantastic tool to com communicate with all users in the GAB and with water managers. So you can see from the previous lithologic, lithostratigraphic model that shows a simplified distribution of the lithology in the system. By using edge constraints, we were able to delineate higher resolution in the subdivision of each unit. And by adding the Sanchez ratios calculation, we were able to refine the lithology variability within each unit to better understand potential connectivity within the aquifers through the whole system. We used this 3D model to update aquifers and aquitard distribution. And for example, here for the Adori Springbok aquifer, you can see the difference between the previous model using lithostratigraphy on the left and the revision using chronostratigraphy on the right. This aquifer is time equivalent to different sandstones that were deposited at the same time through the whole basin, such as the Springbok aquifer, the Springbok sandstone in the Surat Basin, the Adori sandstone in the Eramanga Basin, and part of the Algebukina sandstone deposited in the western part of the Eramanga Basin, and also part of the Gilbert River formation deposited in the Carpentaria Basin. So you can see this revision shows how this aquifer extends further across the whole basin. And by mapping the internal lithological variability within this unit, we can potentially map connection from the eastern to the
to the western side of the basin. So such insights will have water management implications across multiple jurisdictions. So now, using the workflow that we developed within the Great Artesian Basin, we saw an opportunity to collaborate with the Bureau of Meteorology to update their national aquifer framework that they developed as a tool to standardize groundwater information across all Australia, such as the water bore information. And as you can see, not all the water bores have been attributed with an aquifer, and we would like this to cover the whole continent. So with these um, tools and data sets were developed more than a decade ago, so they need to be updated and aligned to the current understanding of the geological knowledge. So we work together with the Bureau to develop some dynamic links between the Australian Stratigraphic Unit Database and the geological units captured in the National Aquifer Framework. So then we could update more systematically the three tiers within the National Aquifer Framework. And this then enables these data sets to be used for decision making more systematically across the whole continent. So using this workflow developed in the Great Artesian Basin, we are now uh, using this to extend across the continent to build 3D continental hydrogeological data sets as starting by the compilation of biostratigraphic data. So this helps us to constrain the time relationships between all the geological units. We then compiled borehole stratigraphy from petroleum, stratigraphic minerals, and water bores to give us this extra constraint to constrain the spatial relationship of the geological units across the continent. These data sets help us to update our national database, and they will need regular updates as the information becomes available. We then use this information to continue extending the stratigraphic correlation from the Great Artesian Basin and going west. This helped us to revise those correlation using revised time-space relationships. We also uh, refined our V-shell calculations, sun-shell ratios, that helps refine our understanding of potential connectivity within the Great Artesian Basin and the overlying Lacquer Basin. This spaghetti map shows the first pass um, correlations that we have done so far across the continent. So using this information, we then developed consistent 3D hydrogeological surfaces, and we extended them from the Great Artesian Basin across all Eastern Australia. And in addition to the borehole stratigraphy, we extrapolated the information using geophysical data sets such as airborne electromagnetic data, and this is an example in the Surat Basin. We also integrated se seismic data, and this is an example integrating legacy and newly reprocessed data that now give us a consistent interpretation across the Northern Territory, South Australia and Queensland. And we also used legacy studies that were published uh, previously. So by integrating these different data sets, these help us to fill data gaps and reduce uncertainty with, within our models. And by mapping the level of confidence in each data set, we can produce some uncertainty maps that highlights areas of less confidence where we can then uh, do some further data acquisition in uh, future programs. So then using those 3D surfaces, we create 3D hydrogeological models and we started in the Great Ardation Basins, which is a data-rich region that helped us to refine the, geometry, the 3D geometry of the aquifers and aquitard. We then extended those surfaces across Eastern Australia, where we have less data, and we then also generated the preliminary 3D models in a data poor region across the Georgina Basin, and we are now continuing to extend this 3D models further west across Western Australia. These models help us to systematically update the aquifer attribution and the 3D aquifer boundaries, and it also enhances our regional geological context for multiple resource assessments.
So this is an example in this data pool region where we were able to um, produce a preliminary 3D model thanks to the new acquisition of seismic and airborne electromagnetic data during the EFTF program. And we generated a model with eight layers from the base of the Paleoproterozoic and through each stacked basin up to the Cenozoic and the ground, what, the ground surface. So this provides a regional context to map the geometry of this stacked basin, as you can see here, along this northwest and southeast transect, where you can see the distribution of this stacked basin and where they could relate and be potentially connected. Now, when we zoom in the Georgina Basin, we can integrate all the boreholes stratigraphy that helps to constrain the deposition of the geological units through the Cenozoic, Mesozoic within the Georgina Basin units and the underlying basin. This helps us then to attribute the aquifers and map their extent and potential connectivity and where we could have potential groundwater divides. So you can see how this 3D framework can help systematically do the aquifer attribution and help integrate with other hydrogeological data. These uh, models facilitate groundwater management and risk assessment at a regional scale. So now from these regional 3D models, we continue extending those surfaces across the continent and we started by mapping the base of each geological era, from the base Paleoproterozoic up to the base Cenozoic and to the ground level. This uh, work is aligned and complementary to other chronostratigraphic techniques that have been developed at Geoscience Australia and contribute to build the EGS database that captures the estimates of geological and geophysical surfaces. This work is ongoing as we need to capture additional metadata that are required for the X database. And you may have heard more about this during the previous talk yesterday by Seb Wong. In between these surfaces, we are also mapping additional time equivalent surfaces that match boundaries between aquifers and aquitard. And we are mapping them using, for the Cenozoic, the framework developed within the Lacquer Basin in the Mesozoic using the Great Artesian Basin and Northwest Shelf Framework, within the Paleozoic and Neoproterozoic using the Centralian Super Basin Framework, and for the older Paleoproterozoic Basin, we are using the Northern Australian Basin Framework. So from these surfaces, we are now generating time slice sediment thickness, and this is an example of the younger time slice within the Quaternary and Cenozoic, which help us to refine the distribution of the sediments within the shallower groundwater systems, where groundwater can flow from the onshore to the offshore to the edge of the, the continental shelf. Now zooming in on the onshore part using a different color palette, we can see more detail within the paleo valleys and other features that can be used to update the Bureau's upper aquifer dataset. All these surfaces have been uh, developed using regional and local scale studies, either recently completed during the FTF program or from legacy data from multiple disciplines. These uh, national sickness maps are in progress. There are still many unknowns and uncertainties. However, our objective is to use them where we are more confident to update more systematically the aquifer attribution and 3D aquifer boundaries. And they can also be used to uh, conduct regional play fairway mapping for other resource assessments. They can also be used to assess CO2 storage potential or uh, other risk assessments. We are uh, continuing integrating these surfaces with the solid geology, the layer geology through time, to refine our understanding of geological variability within and between aquifers. In the near future, we want to continue integrating with other data sets as part of the next program, Resourcing Australia's Prosperity, so we can continue improving our understanding of groundwater systems across all Australia. And we will be start focusing on priorities identified with our stakeholders, such as continuing improving the national aquifer framework, the borehole aquifer attribution, and the 3D aquifer boundaries. 
We want also to collaborate more widely to continue refining the surfaces down to the basement. We want to better characterize the aquifers. We want to characterize the groundwater quality within those aquifers and to understand better how this uh, correlate or relate with energy systems and mineral systems. And to finish, this is a list of some data sets that have been released through this EFTF program that you can access through the links listed here on this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadez. It's quite impressive. Amazing presentation. It is great to see the application of rigorous sequence stratigraphy, a standard technique used in petroleum geoscience, is now applied to uh, groundwater studies. With that, it seems we are very close to releasing a national layered sedimentary thickness map to support the new national layered geology map that was released two days ago by Dr. Henry Heap. And that was explained a bit further yesterday by Guillaume Sanchez. Each data set on its own is amazing and quite impressive, and the combination will be really transformational for Geosense Australia. I think this brings us to the question and answer session. I'm sure all of you will agree with me that you had a wonderful presentation from all the three speakers in this session. And now all the three speakers are with me in the studio to answer your questions or clarify anything they presented. But keep on adding your questions in the question and answer panel on, on top of the screen and include the name of the presenters you would like to ask so that I can ask them. Before you put your questions, maybe I can kickstart with a question to all the three presenters sitting with me now in the studio. You all the three have spoken about a basin resources in the sedimentary basins. How do you see the information you have presented about fitting together and building on one another such that the sum is greater than the parts what you presented a while ago now. Maybe I could start with uh, Nadez, with you, uh, yeah. and then I can move on to other speakers. Sure. Thank but, you. Thank you, Baskaran. So by, present, by developing this uh, common framework, as you've just heard, this helps to bring, um, integrate all the various data sets from the surface to the subsurface geology by um, uh, helping to uh, coordinate and to standardize all the different formats so we can have a, a better understanding of, uh, a, to reach a common understanding that can help uh, better um, assessments of the various uh, uh, resources as a, an integrated assessment but it also helps to um, coordinate our effort so we avoid duplication of work, so we can also build on each other's knowledge. This also helps collaboration within the different disciplines, but also across governments, industry, and um, the communities. Like everyone can help build building this common understanding. And this helps also to communicate by looking at the same object, how all our various um, uh, information relate to each other and how, which impact they can have on each other's resource and um, impact on environmental, on our environmental assets. So by um, yeah, integrating all the data and working together, it really helps reaching that uh, common knowledge uh, more uh, uh, faster and in a better way. But yeah, no thank problem. You thank you, thank you, thank you, Nares. And. Uh, you touch on a number of things, the efficiency, collaboration, mm -hmm. and make sure to coordinate things so that uh, for the betterment of the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Agree that. Move on to Diane, you want to add anything there? Sure. Um, Thank you. I mean, the showcase itself is showing how the Exploring for the Future has brought together every discipline in Geoscience Australia. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. So we've, we've done big picture things from Aramag and uh, um, potential field data and satellite data. And then we've gone to Nadeja's talk where she's integrated um, all the seismic data, which we are very used 
used to using, but I think the scale has changed. We've normally played within a basin or a sub-basin. Mm -hmm. um, and the Exploring for the Future has now tied this across much larger areas. Um, and although the Great Australian Basin is a basin, um, it's the breadth across Australia is amazing, but it's also part of a stack basin, and it's one of the basins on top, and there's much, much deeper basins underneath, yeah. the Cooper, the Warburton, and the Exploring for the Future program has, has brought all of this mm -hmm. information together. Mm -hmm. um, and from, from my speciality and what I've talked about today is the databases. So um, with the seismic data, Nadej, um, I was obviously talking about mapping the Great Artesian Basin and the aquifers, um, the sandstones, aquifers which hold the water, and the claystones and the mudstones, which are the aquitards, which um, pr prevent um, water flow. And uh, you know, it can change that. Um, the, 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 the wording we use, the geology is the same. The wording I would use, instead of an aquifer, I would call it a reservoir. Mm -hmm. The reservoir holds water, but it also may hold oil and gas. The aquitard, um, is in my terms, and what I've been talking about today, is a source rock. It's a rock um, that's very fine-grained, has very low porous impermeability, and it can generate hydrocarbons if there's organic matter in there. And if um, you have a trap, um, your, your source rock could also be the seal to the hydrocarbons underneath. So we're not changing the geology, what we're doing is changing the questions and the language which goes with our different disciplines. Um, and uh, that is the, the building, the, the great thing of EFTF is that we are now uh, talking across disciplines, um, across um, different peoples, um, from people on the land, First Nations people, to politicians. So it's the language which is evolving to, to communicate to people. And the really good thing about uh, the petroleum wells, particularly for Nadeja's talk, is they are um, some of the deepest wells drilled in the Australian continent, mm -hmm. along with the strat deep stratigraphic wells um, that the Exploring for the Future has done. So we have very deep wells. Um, in the Canning Basin, we have Wakali Kali 1, and we, in, in the Carrara Basin, we have NDI Carrara. And these wells with the petroleum wells are a kilometre to three kilometres deep. And your uh, mineral wells and your groundwater wells are on the surface. But by combining all the data, now we can repurpose one data set um, for, for future, future questions. And it's the questions which um, help us repurpose the data sets. And you know, the Exploring for the Future has, has let us put the framework in, involved for seismic. Um, big data sets and artificial intelligence to in, in, interpret these data sets, um, as, as Phil Main's shown, and then reutilize um, the data um, for... Okay, thanks, Dan. Yeah. I think... For um, Claire. Yeah. You, you know, touched yeah. Yeah. To do, yeah, to do a, a, an applied data set with enhanced oil recovery. Yeah. So mm. I'll, I'll pass it across. I think you touched uh, the number of aspects there. The key element for me is that um, through the Exploring for the Future program, we are trying to build that fundamental geological framework for multiple things. Mm -hmm. Although Nadej spoke about putting geology in hydrogeology, it's not just putting geology in hydrogeology alone, putting geology in minerals, putting geology in energy, whatever we do, whatever we have done in the Exploring for the Future will take us to the next initiative we'll be working on in the next 35 years through the Resourcing Australia's Prospectivity Initiative. Now over to you, Claire. You want to add anything? Yeah. I, I agree so much with um yeah with Nadej and Diane. I think um it's really important that we have this these consistent frameworks and data sets for when we are making decisions about future industries, particularly low carbon industries, where we might see different sorts of projects integrating a little bit more to really get the most efficient use of our resources. So for example, if you had a CCS project producing uh, water for pressure management in an area where there, where it's also a hot sedimentary aqu aquifer system, there might be a chance that that water would have other uses, so maybe for geothermal energy production and desalination potentially as well, which then maybe that water could be used to produce green hydrogen. Like there are so many ways that you can um, integrate these systems, but to do that, you need to know 
the resources that you have and be able to apply that consistently to the same area. And I think that's what we're providing the data to be able to, to do. And, and yeah. looking at connectivity Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yeah. How yeah. one part can influence another part of the systems. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Claire. I think uh, the important point what you are making there is that um, integrating various data sets for multiple users. Mm. Thank you very much. I think with that note, um, I can see that a uh, number of questions are coming through. Please post your questions, guys. I might first start with uh, a first question is for Diane. Uh, you are the lucky one to start uh, from uh, Simon George. Thanks, Diane, for your interesting talk. Does the organic chem database include data from international ocean discovery programs such as IODP, ODP, and DSDP expeditions in Australian waters? And then the next question is both on ship and post expedition data, which can include total organic carbon, rock heaval, and biomarker data. There's another question. If not, are there any plans to include it? Over to you, Dan. Interesting That's question. Right. Thank you, Simon. Um, a really nice talk to sort of introduce um, the bigger picture and holding of the databases. So the power of the moment is that we can join together all our different databases. So your first part of the question really uh, starts with um, borehole types. And um, in boreholes, they have uh, minerals, groundwater, petroleum, and stratigraphic uh, well categories. So you can search uh, and um, IODP, International Ocean Discovery Programs, and there's also onshore ones now, uh, onshore discovery programs being drilled. They come under our category of stratigraphic drilling. Um, and then I think if you go to something called uh, properties legislation, it'll actually say IODP or ODP, so you can actually um, filter on your um, stratigraphic type of data. Um, now, there isn't a lot of IODP data collected currently in the database. There are some data, and this takes me back to working in the Exmouth Plateau. Um, so a long time with okay. Nadej and some yeah. of my other <laughs> colleagues, we were working on the Exmouth Plateau for all sorts of um, commodities. Um, and we were looking at uh, Triassic, the growth in the Triassic reefs um, out there. Um, this is obviously fossilised reefs, um, uh, maybe, I don't know, 800 kilometres kilometer down in the earth. And the IODP wells are the only wells to penetrate those sections. Mm -hmm. So I do know there is uh, Rocky Val, um, total organic carbon, uh, and possibly isotope work on the limestones in the reef complexes. Um, and you open up another question here, um, really about priority of data loading. So the data in the databases sort of follow where Geoscience Australia is going around and been in the past and where we're going to in the future. But there's an awful lot of data still to load and I guess questions like this will probably focus the future priorities of what data sets we can enter um, to, 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 to answer different questions for different industries and different environmental concerns and different water concerns. So keep your questions coming on these because it will shape um, future program and I would like to get all of the data in but I know I know there's the data on the Exodus Plateau but I'm not sure about other wells yet. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, uh, for your answers for those three questions there. And then I think we've got another question uh, for Nadez uh, from Martin Smith. Uh, Nadez, what a fantastic presentation of a massive program. It was quite impressive, I agree. Do you have a wish list of, say, three areas you could like to fill gaps in the 3D hydrogeology? That's the first question. And the second question Martin is asking is, how would you go about filling gaps in those areas? And then the following question is, are there plans to include hydrogeological parameters in future updates? Over to you, Nadez. Yes. 
interesting questions. Yes, very interesting. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. So um, the first part of the question, a wish list of, for three areas to fill the data gaps. At the moment, because we are looking at a national scale, so there are still plenty of gaps. <laughs> At the moment, we are trying to reach a national coverage. So we started, as we've uh, just heard, in the Great Artesian Basin in the east, then rolling to the north and center and going west in the canning. So the idea is to keep linking those uh, correlations from the region where we've already started. So uh, also working in collaboration with my colleagues where the interest is through the the coming uh, program, so focusing in the deep dives where everyone will be looking at uh, different commodities. So we'll be looking at filling the gap between the Georgina Basin and the Canning, so in the Bering Dudu region. But also, obviously, it would be nice to keep going further west in the Western Australia and in the south, and keep uh, also infilling gaps going south of the Great Artesian Basin. Uh, across uh, New South Wales, Victoria, and et cetera. So, but there's plenty, plenty of gaps. The priority will follow the program that uh, GA is um, uh, planning so t we can keep integrating all the, res the resources together. Then the next question, uh, the way how to fill these gaps. So once we will uh, keep rolling across the continent, we have to select um, the boreholes that have the maximum of data available, so we can have a consistent interpretation collating to, to keep uh, having this um, consistent um, correlation between the regions that have already been uh, analyzed. And then infilling with other geophysical data sets. Now we've got uh, the airborne electromagnetic data that is covering most of these regions, so we will work into using this newly acquired data and seismic where it's available and other geophysical information. And then the third part of the question, is there any plan to include hydrogeological parameters? Yes, definitely. That's why we, are, we want to <coughs> use uh, data sets that have um, started to be developed and um, build on them to integrate with all the uh, porosity, permeability, um, uh, all, all the parameters that will uh, indicate um, hydrogeological um, uh, parameters, param yeah. yeah, all the hydrogeological parameters, but also inform on the depositional environments that will indicate the characteristics of our aquifers and aquita. But it's also a fantastic, um, like the uh, paleogeographic maps, as uh, you've seen at the start of the presentation, are a fantastic resource for all the resources because to understand. Uh, which rock you're looking at and in which environment they were deposited that can help understand better the different um, systems. But, uh, thank you. Yeah. Th thank you, Nadez, to cover answers for all the three questions. The answer is yes. We will be doing that in the next 35 years as part of the RAP initiative. Moving on to the next question, I think the question is for Claire for you from Simon George. It was a cool talk. Uh, Claire, thank you so much. Uh, for delivering such a wonderful talk for the definition of presence and extent of residual oil zones. You mentioned the use of oil shows, and I'm wondering if you also use fluid inclusion based techniques such as grains with uh, oil inclusions or fluid inclusion stratigraphy for this, maybe Claire, you can start, others can add as well. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Simon, that's a great question. Um, so we didn't use these, uh, mostly because of the scope of the project, but I think that would be a great thing to include in the future, especially because we do have this data. Right, Diane? Like, <laughs> yeah. So um, in, the, in the database, um, as I mentioned, OrgChem actually has uh, a lot of sedimentary rock um, analytical values, um, it's, it, it's, it's quite broad and, and this um, question is relating to what we call our bulk rock or bulk oil database. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's um, the fluid inclusion um, analyses. So uh, grains with oil inclusions, GOR, 
um, uh, sorry, GOI, and fluid inclusion stratigraphy. Uh, it held in the bulk rock table. And as you've heard from Chris Borum, um, we're using a lot of this type of data um, where you don't have a known resource, but the little um, fluid inclusions, the little time capsules, mm. And that's held within the rock, usually when the cement was forming. So it's actually, the fluid inclusion forms when you've got fluid flow. And these are not only time capsules, but they're also temperature capsules because you can uh, work out the temperature of the fluid inclusion formation. And then you can look at the fluid in the fluid inclusion. So the fluid inclusion could be just water, it could be oil, mm. it could be oil and water, or it could be oil, water and gas. So these little fluid inclusions can be used for many mm -hmm. um, questions to answer. I mean, Chris, Chris Borum was looking for hydrogen in the gas, in the fluid inclusions of the gas. In this case, you'd be looking at oil inclusions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there isn't, th this uh, is a new addition to the database. So there is mainly um, the data that's loaded is, is the fluid, is the uh, Exploring for the future data, particularly Chris Borum's uh, data sets, but also we've used it for um, exploration uh, purposes um, th throughout multiple, multiple commodity things in the Proterozoic. So there's quite a lot of fluid inclusion uh, reports out. I think we've got 12 new ones. Um, and that will add to some of Simon George's work because CSIRO pioneered a lot of uh, work in this field and looking at the um, all the fluids in the ports and uh, CSIRO have a lot of reports in the public domain um, they are not all entered yet Simon I'm sorry but um, again it can go on the the priority list of things to do but we do have data actually loaded as well excellent thank you Claire and um, Diane for responding to uh, Simon's question uh, maybe I ask everyone to keep on posting your questions and the question and answer part of the screen on the top, everyone. The more the question we get, the better we will be in terms of uh, providing answers so that we can work with you guys. Don't hesitate. Every question is a valuable question. The next one is for Diane, for you, from uh, uh, one of the participants. They are asking, is there a guide for researchers to prepare data so it can be included in the geochem database? That's what a really, you? really great question because I wish that question had been asked 50 years ago <laughs> <laughs> because then we'd have some standardization. Yes. So organic geochemistry and sedimentology and isotopes um, in sedimentary basins and for, say, petroleum fluids have not been well constrained. So I know the minerals people have done a much better job in the industry and academia to be consistent in their reporting. So geochemistry, there has been um, a really wide um, variation of data reporting in every way you can do. And it's also been um, purposely made that way because in the past, there was so much exploration activity. It was in people's interest not to do things the same as someone else. So you had a unique data set. Yeah. So the big challenge of pulling together these data databases is that I've had to go through back to 80 years worth of geochemistry data not prepared in any standardised context. So at the moment we, we can actually load most data from anywhere and it, we, we can actually accommodate that. How to do help to go forward um, for researchers is one, um, I'm going to be hopefully doing in the next program doing some education on how to do things better. Um, basically we're following the tables but at the moment any data in any format I can basically handle um, which has been a really really hard job for the last two years but we, we can do that. Um, we can standardise things and put out suggestions um, and it has to be suggestions because everyone's got their own opinion and we're all very opinionated. <laughs> no problem, <man. laughs> um, But there are also really good, um, I guess, global um, databases and data standards being uh, put out, which um, 
as Mark Webster was talking, we are trying to conform to any global standards. Mm -hmm. There are global standards for organic chemistry, there are global standards for inorganic chemistry, and now we sort of need to do geoscience chemistry and okay. put the standards. Mm -hmm. So there are organisations globally to do that, and there's also a lot of work between the, um, the states and territories and Geoscience Australia to try and bring some okay. cohesiveness. No so problem. it's ongoing, and watch your space, and I'll try and do some, uh, some put out some guidelines in the, in the next No problem. The Thank you so much for responding that. Uh, Nadez, you want to add anything? No, no. No problem. Thank you. So I think... Um, the same problem, wouldn't you? With pulling yeah. the data in yeah. to do right. the announced whole recovery. It's yeah. getting the data in the same format. That's and right. it is it's difficult. a big job, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. We have to start somewhere anywhere. I think there is a question for Nadez um, from Michael Coston. Uh, in a chronostratigraphic framework, how do you classify contiguous aquifers below a major unconformity cell aquitot? Um, thank you, Michael. So how do I classify? So it, uh, first we'll have to, um, uh, by this chronostratigraphic uh, approach, we correlate uh, time equivalent uh, geological units, but it doesn't mean that uh, th this uh, de uh, formation deposited during the same times were deposited in the same environment and having the same properties. So you, you may have adjacent uh, aquifers with very different properties. So by uh, classifying um, those properties uh, uh, with common standard, you can then uh, uh, you can group them. You, you can group them yeah. as a, a, a good aquifer or a partial oh. aquifer, even though they, they were deposited at the same time and may form part of the uh, main regional aquifer. But in in one region, big regional aquifer, you. You don't have an aquifer everywhere, like I was showing uh, at a, a, a local scale. You may have some uh, shell deposited uh, uh, within uh, nearby the a sandstone. Mm -hmm. So the yeah the, the main aquifer may have parts of uh, acritard or partially aquifers. So by categorizing the properties of these different um, and then grouping them based on the different aquifers and aquitards, you can classify them. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Nadez. I think um, uh, you guys have uh, covered a number of questions from the participants. Um, I think we have to draw uh, the question and answer session to a close now. Um, there were many more questions on the chat, but we didn't have time to answer them everything because of a, a limited time. Uh, but. Um, we would be happy to answer your questions. Um, we will come back to you. But in the meantime, I, I would like to thank all the three speakers, Dan, Claire, and Nadez. And, and not only the speakers, but also all of you sitting there and listening to that such a wonderful presentations delivered by these three eminent scientists from uh, Geoscience Australia. Without your support, um, we would not have done it. If you would still like to ask any questions, don't hesitate, we can get an answer to you, but send us an email at eftf at ga.gov.au. So that's come to the close of this uh, session three of uh, uh, day three. I think the, the showcase will continue uh, in an hour time. Don't go anywhere. You want to have a cup of coffee or lunch or wherever you are, have and come back, you won't be disappointed. And the next session will be on towards a, a national inventory of resource potential and sustainable development. With this note, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers. Uh, clap to everyone, such a wonderful presentation. Remember that the link for this session will work for the next, next session as well because all the three sessions for one day, if you register, you can attend all the three sessions. If you missed anything from today's showcase or you would like to rewatch something, the recordings will be available in the coming days or our showcase webpage. Our eminent people here are working. They are happy to work 
in the next few days or week and then they will put it under ga.gov.au forward slash showcase so that uh, you can get everything and you can watch if you missed anything. So we look forward to see all of you back in an hour time for the next session. Thank you so much.